Good morning, everybody. It's really great to be here. Of course, I'm from the United States, so anytime I'm out of the country, it's obvious it's really great to be here, uh, which is just an invitation. You can laugh at America in my presence. I won't take it personally. Um, uh, the, the title of this segment of the program is The System That Binds Us. And I'd like to expand that just a bit to start by recognizing we're talking, of course, about systems, plural, that bind us. And so let's give them their proper names. Patriarchy, of course, white supremacy, the imperialism of the first world, especially these days the United States, and of course, capitalism the systems that bind us. Uh, so let's deal immediately with what I often call the irony of being me. Uh, I am a man in a patriarchal world. I am white in a white supremacist world. I'm an American citizen in a world dominated by that country. And I live comfortably in the middle class with a professional uh, identity. In other words, in all of these positions of unearned privilege and power, I happen to have ended up on top. Uh, as a friend of mine always says, Jensen, if you'd been born good looking, you would have had it all. <laughs> and so it's just to recognize that I'm aware of my role in all of this, that those of us with that unearned privilege and power have an obligation to leverage it in resistance within movements that are led by people really struggling for their own lives in so many ways. And so one of the questions I get asked a lot is how did you get to this place? And I wanna talk a bit personally for a moment. Um, it's interesting, I'm, I just turned 60 years old and this process for me started half my life ago when I was 30 and I returned to school. And I thought at that point I knew a lot about feminism. Uh, for instance, at that point, I knew that feminists were ugly women who couldn't get dates. For those who didn't just laugh, that was in fact a joke. I'd... In other words, I had spent 30 years of my life being raised in the dominant culture and I knew nothing about feminism as a movement to challenge patriarchy. I didn't even know what the word patriarchy meant back then. And just to remind us, patriarchy is a system of institutionalized male dominance based on men's claims to own or control women's bodies. It's very much a bodily system, especially women's reproductive power and women's sexuality. And as I started to learn about patriarchy, initially through the radical feminist critique of pornography, which was prominent in the United States in that period, that critique of pornography led me to a larger critique of the sexual exploitation industries more generally, a critique of men's violence, and a critique of patriarchy. And I want to note two people who were essential to me in that journey. One of them you will recognize, one you won't. The first is the great American feminist writer Andrea Dworkin, sadly now gone for more than a decade. And if one were to read only one piece, a man were to read only one piece of writing, I would recommend Andrea's essay, I Want a 24-Hour Truce During Which There Is No Rape. It was a speech given to a men's group in the 1980s, and it was her answer to the common question, well, what do you feminists want? What do you want from us? And Andrea said, just give us one day in which we are free from that violence. What was most important about that text for me was her, her challenge to men. She said, you know, for years women have been trying to save you and we can't do it anymore. You have to save yourselves. And it was the second person who helped me understand that. His name was Jim Copland. He was a personal friend. No one would know him without having known him personally. He was working as a full-time volunteer in the feminist anti-pornography movement. And after I had been hanging out with that group for a while, he took me aside and gave me the talk he gave to all men who came into that movement. He said, if you are here to save women, we don't want you. And that took me back, because I thought, well, am I not supposed to be here to, to 
to save women in some sense. And he said, if you're here to save women, you can't be trusted. He said, you have to be here to save your own life. You have to be here recognizing that although in patriarchy men get all sorts of material, especially short-term material benefits, if you don't understand that feminism is a challenge that will also help you, he said, we can't trust you. And for years now, I've been using that insight to recognize that to speak to men and encourage them to embrace feminism, one can make an argument from justice. It's the right thing to do. If you actually hold the moral values you claim to hold, values around dignity and equality, if you're a man who claims to have those moral principles, you must embrace feminism. That's the argument from justice. But you may have observed in the world that people are not always moved by purely arguments from justice. So there has to be an argument from self-interest, that notion that by embracing feminism, you can, in fact, save your own life. And what I came to understand was that I had a choice. I could be a man in all the ways that in a patriarchal society, one is encouraged to be a man. I'd been trying that and quite frankly, wasn't very good at it, but kept persevering in this attempt to be a man. And what feminism helped me understand is I could be a man in that sense, or I could be a human being, but I couldn't be both. And again, the entry point for me was the feminist critique of pornography. Like most men in the culture, I had struggled with my use of pornography and had felt both the pleasure that comes from that practice, of course, but also the distress that comes with it as well. And what feminism helped me understand was that pornography was not just sex on screen, as Andrea put it so eloquently. Pornography was eroticized domination and subordination. Pornography was one of the material means by which that domination subordination dynamic in patriarchy was made sexual. And that if I wanted to be fully human, I would have to leave that behind. Now, when those of us in the feminist anti-pornography movement make that argument, we're often told, well, who are you to, to challenge the choices that women who choose to be in pornography make? And that question of choice is important. We know, of course, that women, like everyone, don't choose freely. We all choose under some conditions of constraint and some opportunity. And if we want to talk seriously about an argument in defense of pornography based on women's choice, we have to talk about the real world in which women choose. But even more importantly, as a man in the feminist anti-pornography movement, my job was to say, before we get to the question of women's choices, let's talk about men's choices. Let's talk about the much freer choice that men make to use pornography and start there. But yes, of course, but isn't it really about sexual liberation in the end, one might argue. And here the challenge to the sexual exploitation industries more generally is important. When men try to argue that somehow pornography, prostitution, stripping all of these ways that men routinely buy and sell objectified female bodies for their sexual pleasure which is what those industries are about, men buying objectified female bodies. We have to ask a simple question. If we want to live in a world with gender justice, whatever that might mean to you, if we want to live in a world with some rough measure of equality between men and women, can you imagine that being possible in a world where one class of people, that is men, are free to buy people in that other class, women. Is it possible to imagine a world with gender justice as long as one group is available for the buying and selling of another? And I think the feminist answer is quite clearly no. If you want to think about it in the reverse, imagine a world beyond patriarchy. All right, that was meant to be kind of a joke, you know. <laughs> imagine a world, it's hard to do. Okay, okay never mind. We live in a world beyond patriarchy. Can you imagine that in such a world, the practice of one group of people buying and selling 
the bodies of another group of people would be imaginable. In a post-patriarchal world, would those practices be imaginable? And again, I think the feminist answer is no. Now, again, the last point when in the feminist anti-pornography movement we would make these claims, the last point of objection would be, well, aren't you just being moralistic? Aren't you trying to impose your morals on others? And the answer to that in some sense is yes. If by morals we mean a belief in the inherent dignity of all human beings, yes. The anti-pornography movement was trying to make a moral claim that women are fully human. And rather than being afraid of the label of being moralistic, which of course traditionally has been used against people who are trying to impose very narrow visions of sexuality on people. We reject that moralistic notion of having a right to impose a single vision. But we should embrace the bigger conception of moral as a fundamental claim about human dignity. Which leads us, of course, to other important questions about what is sex for in our lives? If it's nothing but the stimulation of nerve cells were in trouble. Sex has to be something greater, and in the culture, at least in the United States, that conversation is so important and so lacking. So that's a bit of how I came into not only feminism, but what in the U.S. we call the radical feminist critique of the foundational ways that men make a claim to own or control women's bodies. And as should be clear, Although I was raised to believe that that feminism was a threat, what women like Andrea Dworkin and the few men like my friend Jim Coplin helped me understand is that feminism is not a threat to men. It is a gift to us. It is the way that we claim our own humanity. It is a way that we finally figure out not only how not to be our fathers, and for many of us that is a struggle, not to be the man who raised us, but, not, but also how not to claim to be the father more generally, how to step back from that category. And let me finish by just recognizing that this is hard. It is hard because the world we live in is so cruel, and part of what we must do, of course, is face that. And I want to end by quoting another important writer in my development, James Baldwin. Um, and James Baldwin, in, early in the 1960s, when reflecting on the role of an artist, especially in his case, the role of a novelist, although I think this can generalize to all of us, including those of us who aren't artists, he said, the role of a writer is to tell as much of the truth as one can bear and then a little more. To tell as much of the truth as you can bear and then a little more. And given the depth of the crises we face, which the people who put this conference together are, are so eloquent in describing, I'd like to offer a friendly amendment to James Baldwin, that our task now is to tell as much of the truth as we can bear and then a little more and then all of the truth which none of us can bear. And to recognize that we live in a world that it is in fact too much to bear to face all of that truth. It's too much to bear if we try to do it alone. It is at least possible to imagine doing it when we are together and it is in spaces like this that I'm reminded that that is in fact possible. Thank you.